be distributed through the body. They're not located in most areas of the body. They're found primarily in the axillary region. Where's your axillary region? Armpits, there we go. In the groin, I'm not gonna make you show me where that is. And um, the areola of the nipples, And in men, on the bearded regions of the face. Now, like the sebaceous glands, the apocrine sweat glands are associated with hair follicles. And they do empty their secretions into the hair follicles along the hair shaft. Their secretion contains all of the same substances we find with eccrine sweat. So their secretions are high in water, lots of salts and dissolved minerals. There's some small organic stuff, lactic acid, ascorbic acid, urea. All of the things I told you that we find in eccrine sweat are also found in apocrine sweat plus additional large quantities of lipids and proteins. That makes the secretion thicker and more viscous than eccrine sweat. It tends to be a fairly thick substance. Because of the lipids, the fats and the oils that have been added to this, oh, cover your mouth when you do that, please. She's not looking at me. Cover your mouth, okay. Uh, because of these additional lipids, the secretion may be a milky white or yellow color. Remember, we, we tend to associate yellow with fats and oils. Is that why you get those kind of stains? You... It may be, yes. Okay. It might be. Um, because this stuff, do, it's thick, it's going to be accumulating in the axial, axillary region, and it may in fact be what's staining your clothing. Uh, this secretion is te it tends to be fairly odorless when it is first secreted. But because of the high concentration of proteins and lipids, as it comes out onto your skin, microbes that live on your skin, bacteria, yeast, that sort of thing, will use this as a food source and they will begin to consume it, metabolize it, and produce waste products from it. And these bacterial metabolites will in fact have an odor to them. Typically a fairly musky and unpleasant odor. This is what most of us call body odor. Well, they just live on your skin. Well, that actually brings up the idea of what controls this secretion, all right? The apocrine glands do not function in young children. They're there, but they're not secreting anything. So in young children, they're not functional. All 
right. They do become active at puberty. So at the time of pubescence, as the hormone levels are starting to go up, that's when these glands are also going to become active, and that's why little children typically don't have much in the way of body odor, but teenagers do. Yeah. Uh, the secretion is pretty much regulated, not by the hormones, however, but by the autonomic nervous system. This is the part of your nervous system that regulates involuntary or subconscious activities. Your autonomic nervous system right now is running your heart. It's running your digestive processes. It's running the, the urine production by the kidneys. It's regulating blood pressure. It's doing a bunch of other stuff that you're not thinking about below the level of your consciousness and involuntary activities, that's the autonomic nervous system. It's also controlling how much of this apocrine sweat a person is going to produce. The increased secretion is typically triggered by pain, emotional stress, So you're anxious, you're fearful, you're feeling a lot of emotional stress, the secretion is going to go up. And oddly enough, sexual arousal, sexual excitement, you wouldn't think those two things would go together, but for your apocrine sweat glands, they definitely do. Well, it's a, it's a, it, that has occurred to a lot of people. And, and if you take this, that the secretion is increased by sexual excitement, and you add in where on the body we find these glands, well, groin, groin, nipples, nipples yeah. Right. All right. If you add those two together, it has stimulated the thought that these glands are the human equivalent of scent glands that we find in other animals. That these are producing substances that are called pheromones. Which are chemicals that are secreted by other animals as sexual attractants. These are particularly well known among some insects. There's a species of moth that when the female secretes her pheromones, and of course these just kind of drift out and diffuse out across the air, male moths from four miles away will get one little whiff of one little pheromone molecule and will hone in on that female. They will fly four miles to find a willing mate. Right. So we know that these things exist in other animals. There are some examples of this in the, in the mammal uh, part of the animal kingdom, mostly in small carnivores, things like, like raccoons and civet cats and stuff like that. The problem with this is that, although a great deal of research has gone into this, no one has ever been able to identify a true human pheromone. People have been looking through these secretions for 20, 30 years now, because believe me, if you could find a real one that really worked, you know, if you could spray this stuff on in the morning and have women from four miles away running after you, trying to get to you, they would sell a bunch of this stuff. You could make billions of dollars off of this. So there's a lot of research that's been going on, and the emphasis of that research has been on the apocrine sweat glands. The problem is, is that we can't find anything, at least not consistently. 
Some of the research is suggestive, some of it's kind of tantalizing, but it's, it's not reproducible, and the effects, if they are there, are very minor. So, for example, you know, exposing women to the male armpit sweat and increasing their production of saliva by 1.3 percent. You know, making women drool is not the point of this. So, so it's it's not really working out so far. But there's a lot of hope out there that these glands are the human version of scent glands and that they might be producing pheromones. But uh, so far, we haven't found anything real concrete, real, real um, convincing in that. All right, so that was fun, right? It's always fun to talk about sex. Now I'm going to talk about one that's not so much fun. The, the last of the integumentary glands that I wanted to tell you guys about are the ceruminous glands. These glands are modified apocrine sweat glands. And they are found in the external ear canal. they secrete a substance that is called cerumen. Like apocrine sweat, it's very high in lipids. In particular, this stuff contains a lot of waxes. These are the glands that produce what we typically refer to as earwax. When serum is first secreted, it kind of it kind of flows out onto the skin that lines your ear canal. When it's first secreted, it's fairly liquid, although kind of sticky and tacky. And the function of serum is in fact to be sticky, to trap any particulates that get into your ear. So dust and pollen and smoke particles and all this stuff that's blown around in the air around you. As it's blowing around you, some of it may go down into your ear. These particles will get trapped on that sticky cerumen and they're not going to get any further into your ear. They're not going to end up bunched up or, or drifted up against your, your eardrum. Then it dries with these particulates still trapped in it, and it begins to flake off of the skin. So as you talk, as you chew and swallow, as you, as you uh, put your head down on your pillow at night and roll around in bed, as you are moving around, especially if you're moving your facial muscles, this stuff is going to dry and then it's going to flake off. And it's going to kind of gradually work its way back out to the external auditory meatus and work its way out. Carrying with it the dirt, the dust, the particles, the pollen, the little bits and pieces of things that got into your ear. So the overall function here is in fact to clean your outer ear canal. It's just a, a slow way of removing all those little bits and pieces of stuff that might be in the air around you. Now, Another thing that we find in cerumen, and I was kind of surprised to, to hear about, read about this, but apparently it's true, it also has insect repellent properties. Well, better than nothing, all right? 
it does apparently contain substances that when you've got bugs, mosquitoes, and gnats, and so on flying around your face, they will tend to avoid flying into your ears. All right? It's too bad the rest of the body can't produce it. I know. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But apparently, and, I, and you know, when I read about that, I thought, you know, that's probably pretty true, that there are 7 billion people on this planet, which means you've got 14 billion ears, and goodness knows how many insects there are. And yet you very rarely hear about situations where people have a bug in their ear. Now, if you work in healthcare, which I think almost all of you are hoping to do, if you're not doing it already, the day will come when someone walks into the emergency room with a bug in their ear. Could be a cockroach, could be something else. The problem with a lot of these insects, especially from what I hear about cockroaches, is that they don't know how to back up. They only go forward. So you're sleeping, one of them's climbed into your ear, and it can't figure out how to get back out. So it's in there scrabbling around, and the sound must be just, oh, disgusting. So people go running to the emergency room, help, help, help. So um, uh, from what I've seen on TV, which is how I know how this is treated, I watch TV, what they do is they take a little squirt bottle like this that's got some alcohol in it, and they squirt it down into the person's ear, and that's going to stun the bug so it'll stop moving. And then they just reach in with a pair of tweezers, grab it by the hind leg, and pull it out. And everybody, of course, everyone with a bug in there is like, oh, thank you, doctor, thank you. And you're like, I'm not a doctor, I'm a nurse. I know what I'm doing. All right. <laughs> but but it, it doesn't happen all that often. When you think about all the ears there are in the world and you think about all the bugs there are in the world, it's a fairly rare occurrence. You're right, it's not 100%, but it does seem to be working at some level. It, the bugs do seem to try to avoid your ears. So they'd rather fly up your nose or into your mouth than, they, than to go into your ears. You just look amazed at the whole idea. She's like, bugs in my ears? Oh. Bet you're glad you came to class now, aren't you? You wouldn't would have missed that. <laughs> All right, so the last of the integumentary structures I want to talk to you guys about are the nails. These are structures that are found on the dorsal or superior surface of both our fingers and our toes. They are essentially an epidermal structure. Kind of like hair, they're going to have the same kind of growth pattern, the same kind of um, keratin uh, structure. What are they for? What, is, what are the functions of our nails? What, what do we use them for? What are they good for? Grip. Now, you said threat, right? I said grip. Grip. Okay, I thought you said threat. Right. Grip. Is threat a better answer? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, it, it's, not, it's not a worse answer, but you said grip. Really? From what I understand, people who like have lost their nail, it is harder for them to grab with that oh, appendage. I see where you're going with that. Nail. Right. I mean... I, I, I know where you're going with this. I think there is something to that. Apparently, when you, when you grasp something, when you pick something up, you're, you're kind of modifying how much muscle control, how much force you're applying based on your sensation of whether or not you've got your hands on it, right? So there's kind of a feedback loop going on between your sensory receptors for touch and your brain that's controlling how much muscle you're going to use. And apparently, when you grip something with your fingers, the, the fleshy part of your fingers is being pushed up against the nail, and that's amplifying the touch sensation. So your brain has a better idea of what you're touching and how firmly you're touching it 
because of the back pressure of these nails. I've read about that. So you may have a point with that, yeah. Although I don't think that's their main function. I did hear it earlier. Scratching, scratching. yeah. That's what they're really for. That's for, they're for scratching. Scratching and picking. Picking what? Picking bugs. Picking lice, picking fleas, picking ticks. Picking, picking things off of your skin. Now, you think about this, they're, they're really good at that. These structures are particularly good at that kind of activity. Compare that to the claws that we see in many other animals. Yeah, your dog can scratch himself with his claws, but if he gets a little too excited about it, he's going to cut through his skin and cause wounds. Our nails aren't usually going to do that, at least not to your dog, which is why they love you, because you do such a good job of scratching them. They'll come up and lean on you just so you'll give them a scratch, right? They're also, like I said, particularly good at, at pulling off parasites, you or your dog. Get those fleas, get those ticks, squish them between your fingernails, they're dead. Right? So that's really what they're for. Although I will give you the, the grip for grasping is also a very good use of our nails. Now, like I said, these are essentially epidermal structures. They grow pretty much the same way our epidermis does, which means that there is a living tissue that is produced doing most of the work. With our nails, the living tissue is at the proximal end here, kind of underneath the cuticle. This is a structure that's called the nail root. These cells are pretty close to the dermis of your fingertips. So there's lots of blood vessels, there's lots of oxygen, they're very well nourished, they're getting lots of what they need, so they divide and reproduce quite often. As the new cells are produced here at the root, the older cells are gonna get pushed away from the root. Like our skin cells, like our hair cells, these cells make and store keratin. So as new cells are being made, the older cells are making keratin. And that's pushing the water out of the cells. So the further away they get from the root, the drier they become, the harder it is for them to get oxygen and nutrients, they begin to flatten out and compress, they begin to suffocate, and they die. So by the time we get to the main part of the nail, the part that's called the nail plate, That, essentially, that is essentially just a structure made of dead, dry, compressed, heavily keratinized cells. This is, this is dead tissue. As new cells are being added on, the older cells are pushed out. There is a layer of skin underneath here. This is called the nail bed. And that is living tissue. So as the nail plate extends out and passes out across the nail bed, it's eventually going to get long enough that it will extend past the tip of the finger. So there's going to be this kind of free edge to the nail that's extending out past the fingertip. The area just underneath that, where it joins to the skin, is an area that's called the quick. 
it is particularly sensitive. There are a lot of touch receptors, there are a lot of pain receptors in this little area of skin right underneath the free edge of the nail plate. I'm sure you've heard the expression, cut to the quick, right? The quick is living tissue, quick is an old term for alive. It's living tissue and if you break your nail plate or you tear your nail plate so that it is pulling on or exposing that quick area of skin, it can be extremely painful. Even bending the nail backwards accidentally. So, oh yeah, everyone's nodding. You've all had this experience. You've been cut to the quick. Now that phrase has been expanded to mean anything that's hurtful and unexpected. So if someone says something that, that makes you feel bad, you've been cut to the quick, right? But the original meaning of the term was, in fact, uh, damage to this little area underneath the nail. One more part of this that I want to uh, introduce you guys to. In some of our nails, if the cuticle hasn't overgrown it, you may actually be able to see part of the nail root as this whitened moon-shaped area here on the proximal end. And that is called the lunule, or the moons of the nail. So the lunule, or is, or the moon of your nail, is the exposed, or at least the somewhat visible region of the nail root. This is an area where the cells are still alive and are still reproducing. The cuticles, these little edges of skin around the nail, their technical name is nail fold. Okay. I didn't know. So. Yes. Two spellings. The one from the Saladin book has an E on the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's all I wanted to say about the integumentary system. We're done. Yippee. Not for tonight, but you know, we're, we're done with the integumentary system. We're going to move on now to talk about the skeletal system. You guys have spent the last several weeks looking at parts of the skeletal system. Now we're, the lecture portion is going to try to catch up. So what we're talking about, of course, is the bones of the body, but also the joints, the articulations. These are also included in the skeletal system. So let's talk about some of the functions of the skeletal system. Some of these are fairly obvious. Some of them don't immediately pop to mind. What would be your first function? Body structure. Body structure and support, very good. Right. Your body has a particular shape and you are capable of maintaining that shape and maintaining your posture in large part because of the physical support, the mechanical support of your skeletal system. Maybe I got another one. Protection. 
Protection of what? Okay, so some areas of your skeleton are providing protection for deeper, more fragile organs and tissues. And, and you were talking about the lungs and the heart. What part of your skeletal system is protecting your lungs and your heart? The ribs, the rib cage, the sternum, they're providing protection, all right? The skull is going to protect what? The brain. The femur is going to protect what? Nothing. <laughs> Right, the femur is the deepest part. Everything else is on the outside of that. So certainly some areas of our skeleton are providing protection, but not all of it. There are definitely parts of our skeleton that are protecting nothing, all right? So we'll go ahead, and we'll, but we'll say protection is one of the um, functions. Got another one. Blood cell creation. I'm, I'm impressed, all right? Yes, hemopoiesis, the production of blood. Hemo referring to blood. Poiesis is, I believe, from the Greek meaning to create or to generate. So making blood, creating blood, generating blood, hemopoiesis. There's your $5 word for the night. And yes, the bone marrow, the red bone marrow in the bones is in fact responsible for producing our blood cells. Now we're getting into the ones that don't really come immediately to mind. Movement. You know, when we talk about movement, when we talk about, about our body in motion, we think about muscles. And certainly that's part of the story. But in order for your muscles to move you, they have to be anchored onto something. They have to perform some sort of lever action to move the body part. And so our skeleton provides that kind of anchorage. It provides that kind of leverage. When you move a body part, when you move your body, your muscles are working with your bones to produce that movement. What about digestion? What about it? Is that one of them? What are you digesting with your skeleton? Well, no, I mean like your jaw. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, hang on. Well, that would be motion. It's not, you're not really breaking down your foods with your skeletal system. You are taking them in and chewing them with your skeleton, which is an action called ingestion. But it's not really breaking anything that's not breaking down complex carbohydrates into sugars that happens further down right yeah yeah but biting and chewing would definitely require some skeleton but that would go back into the movement situation mineral storage this is the one that most people never think about all right i've mentioned the fact that as our bones are as bone tissue is being made that the osteocytes are gonna draw minerals out of the blood to create that very hard, dense, ossified, stony matrix. And the minerals that they're using the most are calcium. Now the chemical symbol for calcium is capital letter C, lowercase a. And when dissolved in water, calcium tends to lose electrons. So it becomes a calcium ion with two positive charges. The other main ingredient of that mineralized matrix is phosphate. Phosphate has one atom of phosphorus, capital letter P four atoms of oxygen, capital letter O, 
and it too tends to lose electrons, I mean gain electrons, sorry, take it back, so it ends up with two negative electric charges. Calcium and phosphate form the bulk of the mineralized portion of the matrix. And if there's going to be any theme to the rest of this class, it's going to be calcium. We're going to see again and again that we need calcium to perform many of our body functions. Muscle contraction will not occur without calcium. Nerve conduction will not occur without calcium. Blood clotting will not occur without calcium. Transepithelial transport in the kidneys will not occur without calcium. We need calcium, we need lots of it, we need exactly the right amounts. Too much is bad, too little is bad. So one of the things our bones are going to do for us is they're going to store calcium and phosphate, as well as other minerals, sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, and so on. But calcium and phosphate are going to be the big story here. When you consume more calcium than you need at right that minute, the extra calcium is going to be stored in the bones. Then, when you're between situations where your calcium levels are starting to drop and you need more, the osteoclasts in the bone tissue will break down some of that matrix and release the calcium back to the blood. So you store it when you have an excess, you draw on those reserves when you need more calcium. And this is actually a very important function of our skeletal system, this storage and release of the minerals. You've seen all the bones, you know them all, how many are there all together? Hmm? More than 100? More than 200? More than 300? No. All right, this is the illustration from the Saladin book. This is the illustration from a different book. All right. Uh, there are, in fact, in the adult human body, on average, about 206 bones. Now, that's in the adult body. In very young children, the number is actually higher. They actually do have over 300. They fuse together and the number goes down. All right. As you know, these are kind of sorted roughly out into what is called the axial skeleton. What's that? What's so funny? She's not going to tell me. All right. You smoking dope back there? <laughs> Maybe eating some special brownies? <laughs> All right. As you know, these are sorted out into the axial skeleton. Now, in this illustration, that's what's being shown here in the kind of peachy color. Uh, the bones of the skull, the vertebra down to the sacrum and the coccyx, the ribs, and the sternum. It's called the axial skeleton because it's essentially forming a straight line down the center of the body. It's forming the axis of the body. And the rest of the skeleton, shown in this illustration in green, is called the appendicular skeleton because these are the bones of the appendages, the arms, the legs, the hands, the feet, and the pectoral girdle, the scapula, and the clavicles that allow your arms to move and the pelvic girdle, the oscoxa, that allow the uh, legs to move. Right? So we have the axial skeleton and we have the appendicular skeleton, which you guys are all perfectly familiar with. Well, maybe not so 
perfect. I'm a great favorite jet. Now, in addition, we can sort the bones out or characterize them by shape. Uh, this is the illustration from the Saladin book. Uh, it's a nice picture. It's just awfully small as a projection. So I, I tend to prefer this one just because the pictures are bigger. All right. So in addition to appendicular skeleton and axial skeleton, we can also talk about the bones based on their shape. We have what are called long bones. Now, wasn't that clever naming? Long bones. Anybody recognize this one? Femur? All right, good. We have what are called the short bones. Short. Do you recognize it? No. Chances are you wouldn't because we never left these out individually. I, I will give you a hint, it's in the foot. Hmm? No, you don't have metacarpals in your feet. It's the calcaneus actually, yes. The, the talus would have been up here, but yeah, it's hard to recognize with all, without the surrounding bones as a guide, but that's the calcaneus, it's a short bone. We have flat bones. Anybody recognize this guy? Hmm? It's not the back of the head, but you're, you're right. It's one of the skull bones. Parietal? It's the parietal bone. Yeah, the frontal bone would have been here. The occipital bone would have been here. And the temporal bone would have been here. So this is the parietal. Right. Long bones, short bones, flat bones. Uh, yeah, trying to describe that shape is going to take more than a few words. So they're called irregular bones. If it's going to take more than, than a word or two to describe the shape, they're just called irregular bones. And then we have a few bones that are called sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones are small, nodular, which means round bones, that are found embedded in tendons rather than in real joints, or at least not in typical joints. Round, nodular bones that in life are embedded in tendons. Uh, I know we, this, was a, this wasn't actually on your list, but that is the patella bone. It is a good example of a sesamoid bone. The thinking back in the day was that these bones kind of grow up in the tendon from some little seed of bone about the size of a sesame seed. So some little sesame seed of bone will migrate into the tendon, and there it will bloom, and it will germinate, and it's going to form a bone. Sesamoid, from a sesame seed. That's not really how it happens, but it was a nice story. Another example of a sesamoid bone is the pisiform here in the wrist. One of the reasons why on the models it had to be screwed onto the triquetrum is that in life it's kind of floating around in a tendon. It's not actually in a joint with a triquetrum. Yeah. All the stuff you learn when you come to class. It's just amazing. Now, we're, we're going to give you guys a little terminology here, a little vocabulary building. All right, so this is pretty much your typical long bone, showing both the internal and external structure. In the laboratory, even our real human bones are so old that all of the organic material was, has been decomposed and is long gone. All we're left with is the ossified matrix. 
But in life, our bones are covered with a connective tissue membrane that's called the periosteum. So if you go to the meat market and you buy steak or, or a bone-in ham or something like that, and you, and you play around with it a little bit, that you'll find that fairly tightly adhering to the outer surface of those bones is a membrane that can be peeled up in a way. That's the periosteum. The central part of the bone, but we were calling the shaft, the technical term for that is the diaphysis. The diaphysis is the long shaft of the bone. The ends of the bones are, well, an end of the bone is called an epiphysis. You have the proximal end of the bone, so that's the proximal epiphysis. And you have the distal end of the bone, which is the distal epiphysis. The plural there is epiphyses. So diaphysis in the center between the proximal and distal epiphyses. In most of our long bones, the, the center of the diaphysis, the deep center of the diaphysis, has actually been hollowed out. You might remember that beef bone I was showing you guys in the lab where the, the center seemed to be hollow in real life, that's going to have a lot of blood vessels flowing through it. And in mature bone, the rest of the space is going to be filled with adipose tissue, material that is called yellow marrow. It's just fat filling up the space. Typically, it's at the ends of the bones in the epiphyses where we find in the spongy bone the red marrow that is going to allow us to produce blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So these little pores and pockets and spaces in the spongy bone is where red marrow, well, might be. When children are born, all of their spongy bone is just filled with red marrow. In fact, the medullary cavity of the long bones also has red marrow in it. As we age, as we mature, more and more of that red marrow is let go and is replaced with adipose tissue, is replaced with yellow marrow. By the time you reach adulthood, only a few of your bones are still making blood cells. Only a few of them still have red marrow. And this illustration I had it right side up. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, this illustration shows you the locations in the adult body where we still find red marrow. So you'll notice that most of the bigger bones of the skull, the flat bones of the skull here, still have red marrow. Some parts of the ribs still have red marrow. Some of the vertebrae, the body of the vertebra still has red marrow. We find red marrow in the heads of the humerus and in the heads of the femurs and in the os coxa. But that's about it. Skull, ribs, backbones, the heads of the humeri and femurs, and in the os coxa. The rest of the bones have all of that red marrow has now been converted into yellow marrow. Is that why they stopped growing? No. We'll talk about that. I'll get you there. Don't worry about it. But it's part of the aging and maturation, maturation process. 
Now, this does bring up the issue of bone marrow transplants. Right? It's an increasingly uh, useful medical procedure in which people are, are, usually when people have some sort of very severe cancer, like a leukemia or a lymphoma that's affecting their ability to produce blood cells. And so the idea would be that the person who's got this horrible cancer will have their body completely irradiated with high levels of gamma rays and x-rays and completely kill their bone marrow with radiation. Then, to keep them alive, you have to transplant in bone marrow from somebody else. Now, for the recipient, this doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. What they typically will do is they'll simply give the person a big old injection of bone marrow into their blood, and as the blood circulates through the body, the bone marrow cells will find a place to live, and they'll just kind of go out and recolonize that person's bones. So the person who's getting the bone marrow transplant just gets a shot. And if things go well, they're going to live forever. With bone marrow transplants, the issue is the donor. The donor has to donate bone marrow, which means you've got to get into those spaces underneath the compact bone and suck some out. Now, where are we going to do that? Bones of the skull? Are we going to drill into somebody's skull bones to pull out bone marrow? Wouldn't that be kind of dangerous with their brain right there? The ribs are pretty small. I don't think we're going to get very much out of the ribs or the heads of the humeri or the heads of the femurs. There's just not a whole lot of bone marrow there to pull out. And we're not going to drill into people's backbones because their spinal cord is right there. So when we're going to pull bone marrow out of a donor, where are we going to go? We're going to go into the hips. That's right. And last night when I was giving this lecture to my other class, I actually had a woman in the class who had been a bone marrow donor. She could tell us real life how that worked. So apparently they don't, they don't completely anesthetize you because they're going to drill not just one hole into your hip bones, but 10, 12 holes because they're going to suck a little bit here and then they're going to move over and suck a little bit here and then they're going to move over and suck a little bit there. So the person who's donating the bone marrow has to be at least awake enough that they can roll and reposition their hips in response to the medical team's commands. So you're not asleep while they're doing this. So they will inject painkillers into the muscle over the bones, but then they're going to go in with a drill, a bone drill, and drill holes in your oscoxa to pull out bone marrow again and again. And she said it is excruciatingly painful. Because while they can numb the muscle, they can't really anesthetize the bone. So you feel that drill going in. Ooh. I know, she was so brave to do that. But apparently one of her family members was in late stage cancer and it was really the best hope for recovery so she stepped up and she said I'll donate bone marrow and I'm thinking that if the cancer comes back she may not do it again because she was she did not have what you would call a happy or pleasant experience with this although it's a matter of life and death he'd probably do it right would you do it your brother was dying your sister was dying your mother was dying Hmm? Really? You did it too. Well, aren't you the brave woman? So do you, do, did I get it right? Did I remember what you told me? It hurts? They only did three holes. You probably had pretty good bone marrow. Yeah. So, so one of the questions that came up last night was how long did it take to recover? Yes. That's what she said. It took about two to three weeks before she could really walk comfortably. Yeah. I suppose sitting and standing were just as painful. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, you know, I, I think people who are willing to go through that kind of a procedure really do deserve a lot of appreciation. All right, so that's the bone marrow and where we find it. Got some more pictures here of bone structure. All right, so this is a longitudinal section through either a humerus or a femur. You can see that the medullary cavity is just packed with this kind of greasy yellow marrow. This is mature bone. And then this is the head of the humerus showing us the spongy bone. This is kind of interesting. This is one of the flat bones of the skull. And you can see that the outer edge is compact bone. And the inner surface facing toward the brain is compact bone. But we've got this kind of sandwich with spongy bone in between. And when I saw this, it kind of reminded me of the structure you see with sports helmets. Football helmets, motorcycle helmets, bicycling helmets. Um, been watching the Olympics, some of those people are wearing helmets. I guess the, the skiers are all wearing helmets because, boy, howdy, they're banging into stuff right and left and center. All right, and so the, I, I think the way this works is actually very much the way we see with these kinds of sports helmets. The helmet has a hard outer shell, and then there's a layer of padding, and then the inside is usually fairly firm as well. And, of course, if you're in a motorcycle accident or you take a hard hit on the ski slopes, the outer shell may crack, but that soft padding in between disperses the force. So it's spread out over a wider area. The impact gets spread out, and that means the inner surface is much less likely to crack. Okay. Well, I think the skull bone structure is pretty much the same sort of deal. The outer hard surface of compact bone is going to may crack, it may chip, it may break. But that spongy bone is going to act like the padding. It's going to spread out the force. So the injury is not going to crack all the way through to your brain. Lots of skull fractures don't penetrate all the way through the skull because of this, this spongy bone layer in the middle. You get a real bad headache, but your brain is still where it belongs, inside your skull. Okay. Now, in this class, we don't typically talk very much about embryonic development. We're, this is not a class in embryology, and we don't really give much thought to how these organs, how these tissues, how these structures develop. I'm going to make an exception with, of that with bone, with the skeletal system, because one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit further on is how fractures repair how bones heal themselves. And what you're going to see, I hope, is that there's a lot of similarity between how a fracture repairs itself in a mature bone and how the bone develops originally in the embryo and the fetus. The process of developing the bone, bone formation, is called osteogenesis. Now, one of the peculiarities about bone tissue is that it doesn't usually just develop out of nothing, all right? Bone tissue always forms as a replacement for some other tissue. First, you have to have something there, and then it's going to get transitioned into forming bone tissue. So we have two types of osteogenesis, one in which the bone tissue is going to replace cartilage, 
That is called endochondral ossification. in which cartilage is replaced with bone. And the second type is called intramembranous ossification. In this type, a connective tissue membrane is going to be replaced with bone. Some parts of our skeleton are produced by endochondral ossification and some parts of our skeleton are produced by intramembranous ossification. If you have the Saladin book, this is the illustration that according to the figure legend is telling you which bones are formed by endochondral ossification and which bones are formed by intramembranous ossification. Is that what this picture is telling you? People are making faces at me and that's the appropriate response. This picture is telling you nothing about endochondral or intramembranous ossification. However, I have read more than one book. Right? I have exactly the same picture from a different textbook in which they actually put the labels on correctly. Right? What we find is that intramembranous ossification occurs in the formation of the flat bones of the skull, the flat bones of the skull, and the clavicles. I don't know why. Hmm. The flat bones of the skull and the clavicles are formed by intramembranous ossification. All the rest of your skeleton forms through endochondral ossification. The arms, the legs, the rib, ribs, the vertebra, the hands, the feet, the hips, all the rest of that is going to form through endochondral ossification. All right, so before we get started talking about endochondral ossification, I think this is a great time for us